Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. A university in a large regional center was considered young, so it did not have the same prestige as, say, a pedagogical one. The university had its own professors, library, and published scientific works. And at the university, the first graduating class of students was prepared to work at the university. From this graduating class, the most significant careers were made by two of them. David became rector and Jacob became a professor. He lectured and was adored by the students. David and Jacob had once been friends, but long ago their paths parted. David was married and raising children. He looked older than his years and was constantly overloaded with things to do. His many responsibilities at the university and at home left him no free time. Looking at David, you would never say that he held a prominent position, a short man of slim build. He'd been wearing a suit for 20 years. His wife could hardly persuade him to wear one she'd buy or knit for him. But David was in love with science. His university, when he talked about its development or transformation, his eyes began to burn with a fanatical gleam if it became clear the man was in his place. Perhaps Jacob was hurt by the fact that he was not the rector. After all, he was once considered the most brilliant student in the course. His thesis was later published in a separate book. He could and liked to talk, was artistic and very good-looking. It's time to be in the movies. In short, if it was necessary to represent the university somewhere, including abroad, he would fit perfectly with this very Dimka, who speaks so fast that you can't always understand him, especially if he is passionate about the topic. Now it's hard to believe that up until the fourth year they were thick as thieves. Every summer they went on archaeological expeditions, and if anything they stood for each other. At that time none of them thought about high positions. Dinka, however, even now is completely indifferent to titles and regalia. And when he was offered to move to the ministry, he flatly refused. University was his life, very much his brainchild. Jacob once wanted to be an archaeologist too. He spent his whole life on expeditions. Even at the bottom of the sea, he was ready to search for submerged antiquities. But his parents intervened. It was their initiative, defense of a candidate's thesis, and then a doctorate. Their connections played a big role in the fact that his path to science was smooth, without a hitch. Jacob has been lecturing ever since. At first he was stuffy in the university walls. He dreamed of the old days, the archaeology camp the digging, the campfire songs. But he was the only son of his parents. Both his father and mother had overbearing personalities, and he couldn't break free for a while. Then his father died. His mother became ill. He realized that he couldn't go far away. He lived alone. He had a beautiful apartment near the university. But he visited his mother several times a week. If she was feeling well, and if she was ill, he moved in with her for a while. So when acquaintances talked to him about marriage, Jacob, laughing, said that he had an old girl on his hands, so a young wife he would not pull. And his wife would not want to share him with his mother, who had such a difficult character. So past the time when he was considered a promising bachelor in the eyes of society. For him, however, that time was over. After all, even now, when he was well into his 40s, or rather under 50, he retained his imposing appearance artistry, and sonorous expressive voice. Last years among the students did not sparkle and not a single bright star. Every year there was an inevitable dropout. Guys were leaving. The last example when two students took their documents and got a job at the streetcar depot. There was good money to be made there. Girls got married one after another, took a leave of absence, and went on maternity leave and those who studied with visible labor got a haul from exam to exam from course to course. Everyone knew that he was single, and many hoped to screw him. Before, they even argued about who would succeed. Later, the bar was lowered. It became clear that none of the girls, even the most beautiful, will not take to the wedding. But to visit him at home to get credit, it was quite realistic. And there were girls who could tell about these visits, but for some reason they all kept silent. And what happened at the professor's house was not discussed at home. Only Nancy once said, what a bastard he is. What did that mean? Nancy didn't want to discuss it, 
and the professor lived his life to his heart's content. A couple of times a year, he would find a companion caregiver for his mother and go on vacation in winter to a ski resort and in summer to any of the European countries to see the antiquities dear to his heart. When his mother's friends asked her if Igor had finally gotten married, if he had at least had children the elderly woman only waved the way passers-by, and I was completely satisfied with this state of affairs. And as long as she was alive, she wasn't going to share her son with anyone. Kate and Betty became friends by accident. Betty came from a small town. She went to university because she did well here in the regional center. Her aunt lived with her, and Betty settled in. Her house was on the very outskirts of town. It took an hour to get to the university on her aunt's bus. To be honest, there was no time for her niece. She was fighting with her husband. The matter was heading for divorce. At home, there were empty liquor bottles on the cupboard, and the collection was regularly replenished. Her aunt had no children of her own. Nor did she have any experience with them, and she looked to Betty for a girlfriend. In the evenings, when the girl was a woman, came to her with another bottle of sweet liquor and two glasses. Betty knew that now the aunt would complain to her for a long time about her life, about her husband, and she had to give in and sympathize. It was risky to object, because at any moment, the aunt could say go to the dormitory. And Betty didn't want to go there, because the dormitory was really bad. Two nine-story red brick buildings with communicating passages only looked presentable from the outside. Inside there was an atmosphere that showed that the university did not have an extra penny. Ragged walls, elevators that almost never worked. Broken windows in the halls had glass put in, but every now and then they were broken again. The kitchen had one stove for the entire floor, so the students kept illegal stoves in their rooms, and the hot water was constantly cut off. In short, only a few students lived in the dormitory from the first year. Until the last, everyone tried to find a couple among the natives of the big city and move in with a friend or girlfriend in normal conditions. Betty tried to study at night, but then she would come to class. Tired in the classroom, she could doze off and lecture. Once even hopped and became the subject of ridicule, classmates, and bullying the instructor. He took mortal offense. You see, his lectures make some people drowsy. As a result, Betty had to drop all other subjects and learn only ethnography. To crawl through the session and the position was difficult. Even a small scholarship meant a lot to her. Betty was raised by one mother and she could not give her much money. Practically the whole amount Betty gave to her aunt for food, left herself only for travel and to go to the movies to buy herself new tights, a common notebook for the lecture. There should have been enough scholarship money to save for all of this. Betty tried to walk more. And once she got lost in an unfamiliar courtyard, she didn't know much of the big city yet, just exploring it. I was attracted to the old ones, and she herself did not notice how she found herself on this quiet street, which literally breathed the 19th century. Realizing that she was lost, Betty began to look around, who would ask for directions. There was a girl about her age sitting on a bench in the courtyard. Betty turned to her and asked, where do you want to go? The girl asked. Actually, Betty had to go home to her aunt. That's why she needed the bus stop number one. The girl at the marshal in the forehead thinking. You should go to the highway, but it's far to go there, it's better to go to the streetcar stop. The girl was very beautiful with dark hair around her face. Betty also noticed that the bench sent for now was such a bench is usually used by elderly people who have a hard time moving around. Betty had walked around town a lot this day and now realized she was tired. She sat down next to her acquaintance. The girls got to talking. To Betty's surprise, it turned out that they studied at the same university. Only I'm at the biology department, Kate explained. As a part-time student, I couldn't get to the university every day. But when I'm in session, my father drives me. Do you live here? Kate nodded at one of the beautiful old houses. That's our apartment. Lucky you, Betty said. But it was obvious that her envy was light, as they say, white. Would you try our dorm? The elevator worked three days a year, maybe. And I live on the ninth floor. I couldn't get up there. Kate laughed. We also have mice and even rats. Betty chimed in. Recently, a mouse ran right into the middle of the room during the day. 
Wow. I thought I was having a glitch. I used to live in the wrong place, said Kate, way out in the middle of nowhere. We had mice here first, too. The scariest thing is that they can eat supplies in the winter. Cereal. Then my mom brought a cat. I'd like a cat, too. They won't allow it in the dorms. Restrict about pets. Although I know the girls on the seventh floor have a canary. Well, or rather, kinder, and they call him general secretary in honor of the head of the group, sighed Betty. The girls chatted. It was only when she started blowing her nose that Betty remembered she had to leave. And you're not around much. You could hear the regret in Kate's voice. If you're ever in the area, stop by. Everyone says college is the golden age. I don't have any girlfriends. Kate rose to her feet, and Betty noticed that she was moving with great difficulty, heavy on the stick. She didn't bother to ask what was wrong. Maybe Kate is uncomfortable talking about it, but the girl explained the oldest injury. Maybe if they had operated right away, it would be better now, but there was no opportunity. My dad keeps threatening to send me abroad. They say they'll do the operation there. I'll be able to fly like a butterfly. Betty sighed and Kate's dad was lucky too. She'd never even been to the sea herself. From then on Betty, if she made it downtown and herself to the regional library, she was often needed. She always looked into a familiar courtyard and often stood Kate there. The girls chatted about everything in the world. Betty admitted that studying was not easy for her. She was an excellent student at school, but there were so many new subjects at once. To prepare for seminars, you have to sit in the reading room, work with sources, then at bus stops to catch the last bus. And the scariest thing is to get home in dark courtyards. Even the lights are not always on there. I walk with a flashlight. Where do you want to go later? Kate asked. I'd sooner finish the institute and come home. I only have my mom. I miss her. The other girls don't understand me. No one wants to leave here. It's a big city. So many opportunities. They just want to get married, that's all. You haven't fallen in love with anyone here? Kate asked. None of the boys seem to be paying attention to me. There's this one teacher, you know, the star of the screen. Well, she's hoping he'll fall in love with me. That's ridiculous. What if he does? Kate asked slyly. No, no. But if you go abroad, you could have an affair with some rich foreigner. Are you that pretty? Betty shook his head. I need to heal first. You know, I don't even think about it. I mean, I don't even think about it. I want to wander through the woods to our southern lakes, Kate said soberly. Her face became dreamy, but she did not continue the subject, and Betty learned nothing new about her friend. It was only during the session in absentia that she was amazed to see Kate, leaning on a stick, getting out of such a familiar car. Did David bring it to you himself? After a moment, she asked. Of course, I'm his daughter. Kate looked at her in surprise. Didn't you know? I never mentioned it. Well, I didn't have to. Yeah, I hardly ever see my dad. He's always away at work. So it's pretty much just me and my mom. Kate tried to walk so that she was as little visible as possible, but she wasn't very good at it. Nevertheless, she passed the session with flying colors. And not because she was the rector's own daughter. Kate studied with passion and had a memory, which in common parlance is called a photographic page of textbooks. She memorized and retold them verbatim. What she regretted most was that she would not be able to go with the other students on the internship. Kate had only to listen to their enthusiastic stories when they returned. Betty was not doing so well. She couldn't pass her exams and was in danger of not being admitted to the exams. She approached David with mixed feelings. First of all, she really needed his signature on the credit books. And secondly, she seemed to be terribly afraid of the professor. But deep down, she knew what that meant. Betty was in love with him. Betty and Lucky. Jacob was in the office alone sorting through some papers. Usually he was always surrounded by students. Betty approached so timidly that if she had seen herself from the outside, she would have remembered a yard dog determined to enter the house. What did you want? Jacob asked. Without raising her eyes, you can stop talking about Betty. The professor looked at the girl ironically and at the same time evaluating. Betty was not bad at all medium height with a good figure. Golden red, curly hair falling below her shoulders. Her eyes were a big green, 
The only thing that spoiled her was her unclean complexion. Betty tried to scrounge up the money for a beautician, for treatments. But it rarely worked, and it didn't help much. Jacob sighed. What took you so long? It's Friday. Your exams start next week. Until the credits are closed, you won't even be allowed to take the first one. I know. And why did you do so poorly in my subject? Betty could have told me that she had her work cut out for her other credits. Jacob was hoping to cheat. He often gave students such a party, handed out assignments and left the room. But it didn't work this time. What do you suggest we do? Betty stood signing that we were, after all, hard to sign, saying something like, Hopefully next semester you will live up to my trust and get credit, not the exam. It's out there hesitating whether to give a three or a four. Professors know a student's scholarship is hanging by a thread for the next six months. One word counts and that's it. Prepare and come see me tomorrow, Jacob said, seven o'clock. I'll write down the address. This was something Betty couldn't imagine. She just clapped her eyes shut. At recess, she couldn't stand it, shared a student with me. Immediately learned a lot of racy details. It turns out, only from their course. Several girls have already been to Jacob credits and good grades on exams they received. Annotation that went as an appendix. No one complained. He's a real master. The girlfriend enlightened, almost out of envy. You'll like it too. Now Betty was sure that getting ready meant putting on nice lingerie and things like that. She was going to the professor like a bride to a wedding. Even auntie noticed you were on a date or something? She asked. Kind of vaguely answered Betty with a little lipstick. Look here, I won't let you drive anyone, auntie warned. And then wished for details. Who's the boy? Where's he from? Is he from the city or from out of town? Whether it's serious, Betty said without giving it much thought. Her cheeks flushed. She spritzed herself once more with perfume and grabbed her purse. Late for the cab. She couldn't afford one and it took two transfers to get to the professor's house. How many thoughts rattled around in her head as she hesitated to press the call button. When Jacob opened the door, she was unable from excitement to say even hello. To her amazement, his appearance was far from romantic. He didn't resemble a man about to flirt with a girl at all. He rubbed his face with his hands as he made his way into the living room. My big room was a mess right now. Lena looked as if the owner hadn't gotten her hands on it in a long time. Stacks of books everywhere, some papers, notes on the windowsill. The dust from the TV smelled like a cat. Betty turned up her nose, she wasn't wrong. Her aunt's cat litter box smells just like it. And the creep saw that there was a newspaper with a program on the TV. Used it for its intended purpose, Jacob shared. He slipped Betty a sheet of printed questions. Answer these two, you'll get credit. While you're studying, call me. Then Betty stayed in the room greedily perplexed and confused. After a few minutes, she recovered enough to think about the assignment. She began scribbling answers on papers. There was no one in the way of cheating. Finishing Betty waited for a while. The professor wasn't coming. She tried clicking him, but it came out softly, and he probably didn't hear. So she got up and wandered around the house, hoping to find him. He slept in the small room on the couch with a book. He must have thought he'd dozed off for a few minutes, but he fell soundly asleep. The book had fallen on his chest. Jacob himself reminded Betty of a not young boy and began to feel sorry for him. Betty never thought she could pity a man who stood far above her. With the social ladder in mind, one could wake him up or wait for him to wake up on his own. Or leave the note sheets by the couch and walk away, then get credit on Monday. Betty did neither one, the other, or the third. She went to the bathroom, found a mop bucket and a rag, and started cleaning. She moved quietly. Jacob woke up when it was already dark. He'd forgotten about Betty and her test. It was very rare for him to fall asleep in the middle of the day. And now he woke up with a clear good head. He was glad of that. Now it was possible to dwell on his work until deep into the night. He was writing a book but he often lacked either the time or the energy to finish the next chapter. The light was on in the kitchen. Betty bread ate, drank tea, and read her textbook. And for the first time she was interested. Every word seemed significant, and it felt Betty. Remarkably calm now, 
as if she were truly at home in this large professor's apartment. Tidied up by her hands, she looked up. Standing in the doorway was Jacob. I guess I should have embarrassed and started making excuses. Like, I'm sorry, I've been running the place without you. But instead Betty asked if you wanted dinner. Yes, Jacob, and it came gradually. The kitchen no longer resembled a warehouse of dirty dishes. The smell of home-cooked food smelled like that of a neighbor who cooked much tastier than mom and fed Jacob when he was little. I stewed zucchini. Do you have a cottage? Betty asked. He shifted his eyebrows in thought. Some acquaintances brought them. They're obsessed with their dacha. When he had eaten but washed his tea, give me the credit, he said discreetly, changing to you. You have a long way to go home. Betty took the credit as a matter of course. Nodding, she tucked the blue book into her bag. I was gonna clean the windows tomorrow. What time will you be home? Look, I didn't mean to imply that you do the dirty work. You know, messing around in the mud. It's already clean. Betty's not worried at all for some reason. By the window, but where do you live? Asked, she named the most remote neighborhood in the city. Not so long ago, it was considered a village in itself. Where are you going now? Stay here, I'll get you some bedding. You can sleep in the big room on the couch. I'll worry about Betty dropping her chin. Did you get home safely or not? I'm the reason you're late. Betty thought she should call her aunt and warn her. Her aunt's house seemed far away now, as if from another life. She texted her aunt to stay at a friend's house. It's okay, Betty couldn't sleep for a long time. The couch was soft, but it was narrow. And every hour and every half hour the antique clock chimes. So Betty knows for sure it's 3 o'clock a.m. and she's still awake. She managed to doze off before dawn, but not for long at all. Nevertheless, she jumped up first. I was drinking my second cup of coffee by the time the owner woke up. Saturday afternoon slipped by. Betty was washing the windows and making lunch. Jacob hadn't gone anywhere. He worked in his office. And when there was a break, he and Betty chatted. I mean, Betty talked and he listened. That's how I found out how she lived with her mom in her small town, and now with her aunt uncle, and how she wished her college years would just slip by so she could go home. Are you really going to school? Jacob wondered. Of course, Betty, Raz splashed the ox on the glass in a special liquid and took a rag. I have my favorite teacher there. She's retired now, she's got a workload, you know what it is? Forty odd is more than two jobs. It's very hard. Nobody's going to school. I'll be there and Wendy will feel better. And Betty made a soup that made her dizzy even from the smell. After they ate, the girl put the pots in the fridge. I think you'll have enough for three days. And then that he looked at her questioningly in front of Varia, that she wiped her wet hands and began to pack. Auntie there was already worried, probably left alone Jacob. He thought about it. Never before had the idea of having a housekeeper crossed his mind. Yes, he often had women over and stayed overnight. But he'd never thought of an au pair. Usually strangers in the apartment annoyed him, but Betty did not. She was easy to talk to and even silent. She didn't need to be impressed. The girl lives poorly. Rada will probably have a part-time job. Why not? Her peers work part-time in cafes and pizzerias as waiters. Hand out advertising leaflets on the streets, and some even work at a gas station. Worse yet, homework is on fire. She'll be excited about the opportunity. And the next time the girl came to him, he said bluntly, if you a couple times a week to clean up, I can pay you so much. How's that? Betty turned pale, then blushed, and then quietly said okay. She came to work neatly, like clockwork. Soon there wasn't a corner of the apartment that hadn't been touched by her caring hands. She was sorting out closets, organizing his closet, God, he didn't realize he had so many shirts and sweaters and vests. All of it lurking in the depths of the chief veneer. And he wore what hung closest. Now his refrigerator was never empty. Returning home, he was pleased to think of the deliciousness that awaited him. Already a month later, his mother, whom he visited, squinting, diagnosed him. You found yourself a good woman, a servant, he explained with a smile. Pay her well and leave her alone. You should dust her. You look like a different person. Jacob so in his mind treated Betty better than well. 
he gave her the keys to the apartment and had a special card that held money for the household. He let Betty spend it however she wanted and never asked for an accounting, and punished Betty's supreme trust. He remained his own man in front of her. He could doze off, he could work, he could be silent or start sharing thoughts that came into his head. But he was completely incapable of seeing Betty as a woman. He could say to her Betty, can't you make a snack tomorrow, buy a nice wine. I have a friend coming over. He didn't notice how the girl's expression changed, how she bit her lip. Betty nodded silently and disappeared into the kitchen. The aunt didn't know her niece worked part-time. She thought she had a busy college life, sitting in the library, running to the movies to hang out with her friends, or partying at dances. But two tired, silent girl returned home. Now she did not wait for her aunt to call her for a drink. She often offered to sit down herself, and when her aunt poured her a second, and then a third glass, she didn't refuse. They say that love changes a man for the better. At any rate, his eyes begin to burn. Betty's eyes became tense and anxious, like she'd been waiting for something all along, and she didn't see her friends at all. Not even Kate, whom she loved very much. There was no time to drop in. Christmas was approaching. Betty knew her mom was waiting for her, counting the days until the winter session was over. But Betty invariably managed to make it out for the holiday itself. She and her mom never went anywhere. Like most people thought Christmas was a family affair, and there was never a penny to spare. They set the table for two. Mom cooked a specialty dinner that smelled good. It made the whole neighborhood drool. We celebrated Christmas, local time. We went to bed almost as soon as the concert started. Woke up late. We ate out of the fridge, just like everybody else. And we were sure to shout out money to each other for presents. Betty managed to save up for her mom's gold ring last year. It seemed easy to do without jewelry, but her mother had been used to denying herself everything all her life. And her daughter wanted to pamper her. So mom bought Betty a set of cosmetics. She looked at it, leafing through the catalog, but she couldn't even think of spending such a sum. This year, too, Betty was going to be going home at least the morning of December 31. Jacob would probably not want to settle for hawkers for the holiday. Obviously, he had restaurants or some new girl planned for the holiday. Betty, not to suffer, it's best not to see it. But just before New Year's Eve, the professor got sick. Usually the flu would hit their town in February and recede in March with the cold. But there was no doubt about it. Jacob had caught the flu. High fever, bone chunky sore eyes. Classic picture sure you better not come to me, said the professor on the phone to his assistant. Who's after you? What about you alone? The girl was confused. Still wasn't going to go anywhere. Perhaps he was lying. But Betty imagined the picture of a sick man, who no one needs in the literal sense of the word. No one to pour water for him or call an ambulance if he needed it. All his girlfriends had scattered, of course. She sat her lip down. That same day, she called home. Mom, I can't make it. Don't worry about it, but it just happened. We have an exam on the 27th. So, counseling. The girls and I will study together. Yeah, well, I can't get away. You should go to your neighbors. She'll be glad. Ed, the lonely old neighbor, also spent Christmas alone with the TV. They'll both have more fun with their mom. On December 24, Betty was unlocking the door with her key, as if nothing had happened. Jacob was lying on the couch, covered with a blanket. There was a glass of tea on the nightstand next to him. The professor looked most unhappy. At the same time, he was very surprised to see her. But I told you to put it in the corridor and go away. I'm very grateful to you, but I don't want you to get sick. I won't get sick said Betty firmly, though she didn't feel any confidence. I'm inoculated. I'll get you all cleaned up and we'll have a party. I forgot to ask, Christmas tree. You have at least a small, artificial one in the household. I haven't put one up for a long time. It's only when there are children in the family. I understand. Betty put her hand on the professor's forehead when the temperature was last measured. An hour ago. So now I feed you a little, then we drink a fever reducer, then you sleep, while I clean up the place. Jacob felt so weak, he wanted to obey that, sure to him young voice. He was happy to let Betty take control. 
By evening, the apartment shone with cleanliness. There was a live Christmas tree in the great room. There weren't many toys, but the lights from the garland created a kind of magical ambience. Betty was in the kitchen and Jacob, who was feeling a little better, was sitting, covered with pillows. He was watching a comedy. Comedy, eating a red fish sandwich and drinking cranberry Mars. He thought, and that in his time even his mother did not care about him so much, and the holiday was not celebrated honorably. At exactly midnight the champagne glasses were raised. Everything that Betty had prepared seemed unusually delicious to the professor. The girl didn't let him sit for long. She made sure Jacob drank the medicine, turned out the lights. Only the lights on the Christmas tree remained, and the professor fell asleep so soundly that he was not disturbed even by fireworks and firecrackers under the window. Laughter and shouts of drunken companies that gathered in the yard. Jacob woke up at dawn. It was already quiet outside the window. Even the most stalwart had gone home, and he was as wet as a mouse. He didn't call Betty, but she heard him stirring somehow. She came and helped him to change into dry clothes, brought him a drink, and he went back to sleep in the sound sleep of a man on the mend. Betty was in vain, assuring me that she would never fall ill. The flu had caught up with her, and now it was the professor's turn to take care of his assistant. He's not letting her go anywhere. You want to infect your mom or your aunt? Stay here. I can't get infected. I'm immune. I'll call a doctor and we'll be back on our feet in no time. They ended up spending New Year's Eve together. Jacob helped Betty study for her exams. All moral barriers melted away during that time, and the girl had never felt so happy. The professor, when he saw the gift to the girl, it was a book he wanted to have, but the price made him wave away the purchase. Betty, did you get the inheritance? Saying that, he realized that the joke wasn't quite right. The girl only had her mom, and losing her would be a tragedy for Betty. Well, I mean I was going to say did you rob a bank just to save up? Betty jerked his shoulder, showing that the problem wasn't worth the attention. Of the money I gave you, you didn't spend any of it on yourself. I couldn't take money from myself, to look after you, for a fee. She stabbed his shoulder and he hugged her gently. Betty only came home for the last few days of the vacation. She could see that her mother missed her very much and was sad that she would have to be separated again soon. But looking at her daughter closely, she said, I've never seen you so happy. God willing. Apparently, mommy was on to something. Aunt Betty said she would be staying with a friend from the new semester. The old woman was pleased. That's right. You'll be better off with a friend, going to classes, dancing, and talking together. And it's a long way from my university to yours. Good for you for making that decision. The only person Betty told the whole truth about the blockade. The girl herself couldn't give herself a reason why she decided to open up to her. Kate was not just calm, serious. There was a kind of inner strength in her. Betty had never heard her friend lose her temper, become indignant. Betty explained the mutilation. Kate had been through too much. Right now, Kate only said you didn't ask what his plans were. No, Betty answered. How can I influence anything? Who am I around him? The corner of Kate's mouth twitched a little. But Betty knew her friend too well to see it as mockery. I think he wants us to go away together this summer. Betty remembered. He said he never vacationed in Russia. He said I should get a passport too. He talked me into leaving uni. What did Betty think she was listening to? I know the story from my father. But I gave my word not to discuss it with anyone. I'm sorry, I can't even tell you. But Kate, please, please, Betty begged. You realize no one cares as much as I do, but I promised. All I can say is if you tell Jacob to go somewhere by the sea, where archaeologists are digging, he'll be much happier than he is now. It's like her idea convinced him it wasn't too late. The Betty let her friend's words pass her ears. Kate obviously doesn't get it. Jacob has everything here, an apartment, a job, status, students an elderly mom who is unlikely to be able to move. In short, the tree has grown all its roots into the soil here. How could it be uprooted in February, when spring was in the air and the days were getting longer? Betty realized she was pregnant. Later, she didn't know why she decided to hide it for a while. The fact that she was going to have a child was a joy to her. 
everything was going to be okay now. Jacob said himself that his life had begun to change. When Betty came in to sign or not, it didn't matter. But no one had ever given Jacob a gift like she would. She decided to confess to him on his birthday. The pregnancy had been very easy for her. There was no nausea or dizziness. More often than usual, she wanted to sleep and... The smell of peppermint was maddeningly annoying. That's all. And she looked better. Her face, on which she had previously had to put so much abnormal cream, became clean and smooth. She put on a little weight. Her look became calm and confident. Thanks to Jacob, she was now well-dressed and had been out and about more than once. Betty was catching interested glances from men. At the university, she didn't tell anyone about her affair. If the girls noticed that she was no longer rushing to the bus stop to go to her aunt's house in a distant neighborhood, Betty said that she was now living in an apartment. Nevertheless, the affair was soon made known on the course. But Betty behaved in such a way that she was not allowed to ask questions, and gradually the fellow students backed off. No one took Betty's relationship with Jacob as anything serious. Once it became known that Betty was invited to the professor as a cleaner, and the girls concluded that the professor had successfully arranged a free servant, plus intimate services. Very convenient. But of course, none of this would last long. Too plain and unassuming. Betty for a man like Jacob. If he ever marries, then certainly not to such and classmates. Talking to Betty, pretended not to know anything. Yes, the anniversary was far away, but Jacob could not make his birthday go unnoticed. It was customary to bring champagne and hors d'oeuvres to the university department, to treat colleagues, to accept congratulations. And the professor kept the most expensive wine in his office in case of important guests. The rector also stopped by on this day. But it wasn't worth spending a collector's French wine on David. He did not know anything about drinks and preferred a shot of white wine, and occasionally on special occasions. Actually, his doctors had forbidden it. A stomach ulcer. Alcohol was to be avoided. At home, Jacob told Betty I didn't want you to bother. Let's go to the restaurant. Everyone will see us. Betty waited for Jacob to say, so what? Let them look and be jealous. But he reassured her with the wrong words. It's a small restaurant, very quiet. We'll rent an office. I'm sure no one will notice. Betty put on a new dress, blue, velvet. I guess her fellow students aren't adorable. They'd share one of these. They'd say it was old-fashioned. But Betty wasn't much of a fashionista, even though she now had the opportunity to dress well. She found the dress very pretty and the pearl earrings she'd chosen for the day were nice too, before leaving them alone. The waiter lit a candle on the table. Jacob had placed the order himself. He knew Betty wasn't versed in fine cuisine, and the names of the dishes didn't mean anything to her, but he decided to treat a Cinderella. You're probably wondering why I didn't get you anything? Said Betty. And looking at Jacob with loving eyes. Yes, I have everything in the world. I don't want you to cut yourself any slack. Well, let's just say it's not everything in the world. Anyway, I wanted to tell you. She winced for a few seconds. And then he got her news, hung up the silence. And the longer it dragged on, the more Betty seemed to think that something was going wrong in a very different way than she had imagined. Betty softly began Jacob. What do I want you to do now so you don't think I'm a sneak? Think about it. Let's take this easier. You and I will go, you'll be looked at. I'll pay for everything. And the problem will be solved. He didn't say that dreaded word he wanted to throw words at him, assuring him that it would be painless, comfortable, safe, that everything would soon be forgotten. Good, he asked with a soft smile, stroking his hand. Good. She didn't hear her voice. You realize you have to finish your studies. And I don't need and never have needed babies. Of course it's my fault. I realize that. I'm not denying it. You're too young and inexperienced. So let me atone for it by promising you won't experience anything less than the dentist's office. You're right, Betty. Good, she whispered. A quarter of an hour later, she said, excusing herself to go to the bathroom. Near the front door she turned, ran sharply out of the restaurant, stopped the first car she could find, and gave the address to her aunt. When she showed up at her relative's house, frozen tooth on tooth, with eyes like she had just buried her closest loved one, 
The aunt froze. Please, please, please pour me your lemon of liquor if you don't have vodka, said Betty. I've collapsed the university, said Betty to her friend. She and Kate sat in the garden on the glass loggia. Kate had grown all sorts of things. It was warm and had two cozy chairs. This was where Kate liked to work, sitting under the roofing and green leaves. What do you mean you're leaving? Kate asked, and in her voice Betty heard a metal that she had never felt before. But I can't see him every day, and I have to go. He can't leave a job that's so lucrative. He's the king of God at uni, the students look at his mouth. Exactly. He's not going to go away, Kate said. And you've got nothing under your belt. If you drop out, you'll have to go home. You don't have a university there, you'll be without a full education. I won't have time to study now, where and with a baby allowed in the dormitory. I think the second floor is for families. Now they'll give you a room. Do you know how they live there? Our dorm is in the private sector. There's no mains. Only boiling water comes out of the tap. Can you imagine? Somebody has no hot water, and the dorm has no cold water. The girls are washing diapers, and my hands are red as beads. And to go to uni, everyone knows and whispers. And I hear that whispering behind my back all the time. And I don't think Jacob's gonna let me compromise him like this. If I don't get an abortion, he'll get me out of the university. Kate sat in silence, thinking about something. I want to talk to him, she said finally. What in God's name are you talking about? Betty opened her eyes. Are you threatening to have your dad ruin Jacob's career? If you won't marry me, please don't. I wouldn't marry him at all now, even if he proposed. After he sent me away. He's got a dad of his own, I'll leave him out of it. He's not of this world at all. Kate grinned slightly and gave Betty a very grown-up look. He'll pay off the necessary equipment for the lab. But he'll forget that there's no cold water in the dormitory. Can you believe it? Betty, he eats pumpkin. He loves pumpkin more than anything else in the world and asks his mom to make it every day. He doesn't need no spread. And his favorite shirt has been changed for the third decade. He's used to nothing else. You shouldn't let daddy be involved in any of your worldly matters. It's ridiculous. Don't worry, Betty. I won't intimidate your Jacob and I won't ask him for anything. I'm just gonna tell my story. What story haven't you told me? No, I haven't. I gave my mom my word that no one would ever find out. And you know I keep my word. But now please give me your Jacob's cell phone number. Maria, Kate's mother was from Canada. It was a very quiet corner with only one convenience store. We took the bus to the center twice a week. The young people from here invariably left when they finished school. It was a good thing Maria's family had many children. Brothers and sisters made up for the lack of friends. There was someone to play with, to wander in the forest. Maria's parents sadly realized that it was not their chicks who would fly out of the nest, although they themselves were not going to move to the city, and hoped that at least one of the children would stay to brighten their old age. Maria was 16 years old when Kevin, a new man, arrived in the village. But Kevin would have attracted attention in any society. He was a little over 30 at the time. Until recently, he'd been working as a geologist, but then something had gone to his head. As Maria's mother indelicately put it, and he wished to live in the arms of nature, to hunt, to plant a vegetable garden. He wished to eat what he had grown and to drink key water, to be surrounded by forest, birds, animals, and no people. He came to the village to find such a place in the vicinity and settle there. He seemed to be a healthy man, his mother said, as he had to work and work and work. But what's he up to? He's healthy, but his head must be sick. Nevertheless, when Kevin paid those people who knew the area well, they pointed him to a hunting hut far away in the woods. It had been abandoned for the last few years, only occasionally occupied by those who went out with a gun for trophies and came back. Kevin came to like it. The place suited him completely. Absolute silence. A small creek in the neighborhood. The cabin had a stove and the essentials of a table. A few benches. I'm ready to buy this house, he said, only to be laughed at. Who would sell that hut? No one lives there. She settles in by accident. No one will kick her out. Maria knew the place well. There was a time when she and the boys used to play there. It's funny because they have their own house there. But it was always summer, and they'd linger in the hut. 
well if it was just for a few hours. And in the evening they were expected, the house surrounded. But the girl could not imagine that it was possible to stay in this wilderness for the winter. It's freezing out here, the snow falls over my head. If anything happens, I'll try to get to people. She had no idea that her opinion would soon change. There were no guys her age or older in the village, who could she set her eyes on? Kevin was the first to take notice. And soon the girl fell madly in love with him. At first it seemed innocent enough, Maria helped Georgie to get used to the local area, showed him plants, taught him what was poisonous, what was edible, where it was better to pick mushrooms, where hunting was good, and where it was useless to wait for the beast. She carried him from home milk and bread, bought at his request in the village store needles, threads, and all sorts of small things, and did not notice how the time came when she could not live without Kevin. When Maria told her parents that she was moving into the hut, they were stunned. Then the mother began to live as a schoolgirl's father, and the father threatened to shoot his daughter's chosen one with a hunting rifle. But the girl at that time felt happy and said Alyosha still will not hold on. I'll went away to him. If he lets me go in good faith, I'll visit you, but not. So let's say goodbye for good. Her parents knew Maria's stubborn, unyielding character and realized she would still do her own thing. The next day, the daughter packed her things in a backpack and left, humming her new life. But soon she regretted what she had done. Her parents didn't recognize it. Maria had always been secretive shared only about the good things, and all the difficulties and sorrows experienced alone. At first everything went well in the new place. Maybe if the girl had lived in the city before, she would immediately feel the change and be disappointed. But for Maria, there was the usual housework. She knew how to cook, so, do laundry in her snug hut brought coziness. Once a month together with her husband, she came to the village, visited her parents, brought them forest guests. Usually it was Siberian berries or fresh fish. Maria washed in the bathhouse, and no wonder, and the village councils. And the next day she would go back to her forest hut with Kevin. And then winter came. This year it was particularly harsh. It was impossible to walk to the village. There was too much snow, and the young woman spent her days in the small hunting lodge. The stove had to be stoked often. The cabin put out in a flash from all the entertainment a few books in the counted already 100 times. Maria couldn't wait for it to get warmer, for the forest trails to dry, and for her to be able to visit her own. When she finally reached the village, she learned the bitter news. Her father had died at the beginning of winter, and her mother had fallen ill. Maybe it was because she had lost the man she had lived with all her life. Maybe because she was worried about the fate of her youngest daughter, one way or another, she could not be without medical care, and the older children took her to their home in the city. The native house met Maria, warded up windows. That same year Maria became pregnant. Then she for the first time stammered that probably for the first time she should move closer to people, return to the village, get on the register, so that help would be nearby, if anything. And when the child was born, until it grew up a little, you can't keep it in the middle of nowhere. But Kevin dismissed all her plans. He began to assure Maria that she had to rely on nature. Childbirth is a natural process, and everything will be fine. And never a city wife's child will grow up so strong and healthy, as their son will grow up here in the fresh air and healthy food. There was some doubt in Maria's soul. She would feel more comfortable if she could get to a doctor in case of need. But Kevin never tired of assuring her that she was a young, strong girl and everything would go well. Maria only managed to take one promise from him. The baby must be born in a maternity hospital. My mother told me that one time she almost died when my brother Liam was born. It's times like this when you need doctors to be there for you. Kevin promised. However, when it was time to get out of the wilderness, it proved impossible. It was raining very hard. There was nothing to think about to get to the hospital in advance. Maria was worried. Kevin again assured her that everything would be just right, and even though the young woman had to suffer a lot, a strong, healthy boy was born. Maria tried to persuade her husband to make contact with the big land. She would be calmer if the doctor examined the child and said that he was all right, but Kevin refused flatly. 
Now, in his opinion, the young mother just needed to recuperate. Kevin himself cooked food, fed Maria, was caringly gentle, and she for a while resigned herself to the state of affairs. Now even in winter Maria had no time to be bored. Wherever her husband went, she was never alone. The child was with her. The mother was worried that the baby might catch cold. She often stoked the stove and still the hut was colder than usual. In the winter months, it used to be in her home. But little Vanya did not fall ill. Trouble came in the spring, when the sun had already warmed up, and mother and child spent a lot of time in the fresh air. The baby was crawling on the grass. He picked up a tick. But when the kid got sick, his parents couldn't help him. The boy died of encephalitis. It was the hardest time of Maria's life. She hated herself for not insisting. She had to move with her son at least for a while to the empty parents' house. Kevin took his son's death much more calmly. That's the way it is in nature, he said, natural selection. Only the strongest survive. Encephalitis cures itself without medication. If Jack wasn't meant to be, that was his fate. A cemetery funeral was also out of the question, according to Kevin. You and I know how it happened, but strangers might not believe it. And in any case, they'll blame us for everything. They'll say we shouldn't have raised the child in the woods, that we killed him. Didn't we? Maria looked up with tears in her eyes. No one can forbid us to live the way we think is right. Kevin spoke firmly. Everything will work out for us. You'll see. Maybe if Maria had her father and mother waiting for her, she would have packed up and gone to them. But the people closest to her already lived far away from here. And Kevin constantly insinuated Maria that she had no one but him that only he needed her. And the young woman agreed to stay. A year and a half later, by the time the girl Maria was born, it was already hard to recognize. Quite young, she looked almost twice her age. Her hands had been chopped off by hard work. Hope long ago disappeared cheerful and slay expression, which before was characteristic of her. It felt so much like her. And it didn't matter that when Kevin went to the village to buy some clothes and groceries, she just waved her hand. Go buy what you want yourself, what if you don't guess the size? I don't care what you bring, I'll wear it." She really became completely indifferent to her appearance, and maybe to her fate. She wasn't expecting anything anymore. Yesterday was like today. So, monotonously passed a month, two months. Meanwhile, the second labor was easier and the woman in labor was quicker on her feet. The baby she now had was not coming down from her arms. Kevin had hoped for a second time that there would be a son, and when he became the father of a daughter, declared that he would raise her as a boy. Maybe some higher power took pity on the girl and her mother. It is not known whether Maria would have been able to bear the loss of a second child or not. Kevin's assurances that nature does everything right, performing natural selection, reassured her not too much. Little Kate's childhood was not easy. No toys to amuse her peers, no special food choices, no cartoons. The simplest food her father had gotten, and the simplest clothes her mother sewed and gave her a single doll, also handmade. Of course, childhood finds its joys everywhere, and Kate enjoyed fiddling with the horns, spending whole days in the woods and learning the lessons her father had taught her. By the time the children were ready to go to school, Kate could read and count to 100 and she could survive a few days in the taiga, even if there were no adults around. But in winter, it was hard. It was literally cold, hungry, and lonely. You could not go anywhere from home, especially in the cold. The older Kate got, the more she realized, the more often she noticed that her mother was trying to change her life. All for her sake. A daughter needs to study, she told her father. Come on, you'll get there. You really need to. We'll teach her ourselves but these schools are full of vices. Children learn one from another, and by the time they graduate, they drink, smoke, and cohabit with each other. I didn't drink or smoke. Mom objected. You're just lucky you didn't get spoiled. And Kate, who's going to get led astray? Sooner or later people will come here. The mother would come in from the other end, and it would be known that the child was sitting at home and not going to school. We'll be taken away. Kate will be deprived of parental rights. If you go back and forth to the village, that's how it'll be. You'll complain about life there. Write that your husband abuses you, keeps you in brutal conditions. 
then you'll lose your daughter for sure. And if you don't bother people, no one will interfere in our lives. The gypsies live as they want, no one touches them. But we started with mom, and we're hermits. It's our choice. Her father cut her off. It may be your choice, but it's not ours. Once dared mom to say, I wouldn't dream of cleaning pots with river sand and wearing Latin. Paid skirt you don't like it? Her father looked at her intently. Go back to your village, and I'll take Kate and go with her where you won't find us. Not me, not her mom. Kate realized that parting them from each other would be the hardest thing in the world. There was no telling how or when their fate would have changed. But misfortune helped. Her father started taking lion hunting, and at an unfortunate hour, they encountered a bear. And if Mon hadn't rushed out to find them, Kate would have died. That's when her leg was mangled. How her mother dragged her daughter to the village before people Kate does not remember. Her mother told me that she carried her in her arms, that she had made some branches and held on through the roadless area. Lucky she didn't get lost. Only one thing Kate's mom kept saying, don't tell anyone about dad. Don't talk about dad to mom. He'll die out there. He's all alone. Don't tell. Mom kept telling her daughters. It seemed that at these moments she was out of her mind. Father is lying there alone in the taiga, and there's no help for him. Mother must have realized that if he stayed alive, he would never give them peace. So she chose such a cruel way to be free, since fate provided the clue. Kate didn't really care about much else. She was in too much pain, too much blood loss. She was in for heavy treatment, several surgeries. But the doctors said that she would have to walk with a crutch, or at best, with a stick. At the hospital Kate was looked at as a wonder, as some kind of female Mowgli, and everything around her was so unfamiliar and alien to her, as if she were on another planet. But soon Kate at the treatment center was loved. She never complained, never got cranky. She behaved with rare courage and unobtrusiveness. Mom told me afterward. She was dealt with. Kate really could have been taken away from her. But Mom somehow managed to convey that together with her daughter became a victim of circumstances, that her husband did not let her and her daughter go to people, or she would have long ago returned to her native home. They were not separated. The mother confessed that her husband had stayed in the Tega. She managed to get her daughter out, but not her husband. But she said that she could not specify the exact place. Of course, a search was organized. Kate understood the mother hoped that while the father was being searched, he would die and the mother would not be considered guilty. After all, the bear had done it. A tragic accident and nothing more. However, the search parties found neither the father nor his body. And for a long time it was terribly disturbing. Kate's mother was discharged, and she and my mother actually settled in my ancestral home. Both of them after Tega Hut, such a life seemed luxurious in the house two rooms kitchen, bath and another kitchen. Summer its own garden with apple trees and plums. Maria was pitied. We helped to organize gas, shared things. And at first, they took out food. Then Maria found a job in the village, opened something like a small canteen. And Kate started to study. She didn't go to school, but the teacher went to her and tutored her individually. She said Kate was barely behind her peers. As sharp as she is, of course, she catches up with them quickly. Maria was worried that Kevin would show up sooner or later. She believed he was capable of anything. The worst thing for her was if he took her daughter away with him. She's a mother, she won't have time to call for help, and she'll lose the girl forever. And then archaeologists came to the village. There was a nearby lake, about which legends were made, as if at the bottom of it lies a flooded city and amazing riches. Of course, at all times there were hunters and they were recruited. They tried to find something without finding anything. But David, who led the expedition, immediately said that he was not going to look for anything underwater. All these are just beautiful fairy tales that have been handed down from generation to generation. But the satellite map is a different matter. It shows that not far from here in the swamp area, there are the remains of an ancient settlement. That's where we should excavate. The archaeologists brought food with them. But when they had an opportunity, they ate not food cooked on the fire, but went to the canteen. They told about Maria, about her unusual fate. And she paid attention to the young woman, began to ask about her life in the Tega. 
and there he and Maria did not notice how they became attached to each other. David knew that Maria was afraid for the child, but she had nowhere to go. She had no contact with her family, and he offered the woman to go to the city with him. She refused flatly at first. Do you need someone like me? You'll have me playing the fool all my life. What have I learned in life? And I have nothing. We're dragging from one paycheck to the next. I only have a daughter, and this is someone else's child for you. How can you love her? Listen to me, silly you say, so she'll be with you. They often call me blessed too. I go to work at home, lock the door. If I forget, they'll mix up the salt and sugar. It's impossible to eat lunch afterwards. I even put my shoes on the wrong foot when I was thinking, and then wondered why it was so uncomfortable for me to walk. So I don't know whether such an uncomfortable husband will suit me or not. And as for Kate, where are you gonna treat the girl here? She needs neurosurgery. I can show her to some very good doctors. Maybe they can help. Kate will get a good education and never return to the Tega. It was probably with this kind of talk that David broke Maria's resistance. She realized that she would have to trust this man completely and, moreover, entrust her daughter's life to him. But he'll get her out of here and never have to fear for Kate. She didn't know why, but she felt surprisingly calm around the absent-minded scientist. But when her mother told Kate that they would be leaving soon, the girl felt real grief. She made friends with the neighboring family, and the older boy Liam became her loyal friend. At 10 years old you can fall in love, you know, but how else? Kate, however, herself did not yet realize that she was in love, but to go away to distant lands and never see a bone again. It seemed worse than death to her. Will you write letters to each other? I persuaded my mother, who, as always, understood everything. David signed with Maria, as soon as they came to town, and he'd arranged it so that Kate was considered his own daughter. Like he'd been visiting her mother for years, and now he's finally married. Kate was treated in good sanatoriums, taken abroad. A long time ago, no one could think that this girl was once considered Mowgli. Kate grew up to be very beautiful, except for her leg, which had not fully recovered. Some important nerve endings had been damaged. It would have been a beauty contest, if Kate had wanted it, of course. And if it hadn't occurred to her, and it never would have occurred to her. She still wrote letters to Kostya, who had graduated from the Forestry Technical School and was now in the Army, and did not initiate her relatives into the details of this correspondence. Mom, of course, thought that it was the remnants of childhood friendship, which dragged on for years. Well, let her think so. Kate also didn't dream about her father very often. They were terrible dreams. She'd see him in the woods, lying dying in the snow, or she'd think he'd come and knock on the window, wanting to take her with him. She woke up to that knocking. Of course, Kate had girlfriends when she was in the sanatorium, but all those relationships ended when it was time to leave. But Betty, without realizing it, had become attached to her. Sometimes it seemed to her that when she was a child they had lived in the same village and had been firm friends, only then they'd forgotten about it. And now what had happened to her friend, Kate took to heart. She couldn't let. Jacob, break the laces of life and everything like that. That things would go wrong for the girl, Kate had no doubt. Betty was broken. Kate wouldn't allow herself to break down like that even in her most difficult moments about Jacob. Kate had heard from her father. Her stepfather had been called daddy for a long time now, and surprisingly absent-minded. David often felt sorry for his imposing, confident friend. Jacob should have had a different fate better. It was not uncommon for his father to say. His parents were forcing him to pursue a career, and he had resigned himself to it. It's hard when a man gives up what he has a calling for. Skate Jacob didn't see Jacob, and if it weren't for Betty wouldn't have felt any interest in this person. Now that she had a piece of paper with his phone number in her hand, she sat for a while, wondering. What would she talk to him about? It would be ridiculous to convince him that Betty was a decent girl and he should marry her. It's a kindergarten and nothing good will ever come out of the election, and Betty won't agree to it. Kate lifted up with difficulty went to the window and stood for a while, staring wildly out into the courtyard, and then returned to her favorite chair and picked up the phone. Jacob, her voice was not like her usual voice now. It sounded different. It's Kate. Do you remember David's daughter? 
Yes. Rector. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. I'd like to come to you. Yes. Home you heard right. It's not exactly easy for me to walk, but still. No, you're not coming to me, I'm coming to you. I know the address. Please name a time that is convenient for you. Kate felt her interlocutor's slight confusion, but she wasn't going to make it easy for him and reveal her cards right away. Having made an appointment, she ended the conversation. Jacob was really excited. Betty hadn't come to see him in days. He was no longer lecturing in her class. They had not been able to meet in the auditorium. On the contrary, at the university, she had resolutely avoided him, always in his company. He could not approach her. He felt uneasy. There was no telling what a girl could do. She should have agreed to his proposal. Soon she would have forgotten all about it. The old relationship between them could be preserved. At any rate, until she finishes college, and there Betty herself will probably find a suitable groom for herself. She can't not realize there's such an age difference between them. He wasn't going to marry anyone. The second option would have been even better if Betty had disappeared from his life altogether. Both of them had made a mistake, and both of them would try to fix it, erase it from their minds. Each would start living their own lives. Worst of all, if a girl starts acting out on her own out of pride over some private citizen, God forbid something untoward happens. He'll be at fault if she decides to have this child, file for child support. Now, that's just not good enough. So everyone knows he's got a son or daughter growing on the side. Betty will start blackmailing him with the baby. There will be no end to her requests. Jacob knew the Chancellor had a daughter. And there was talk of her having some kind of health problem. But what did the girl look like? He couldn't even vaguely remember. She wasn't in his department, and she was a part-time student. Why would she need him? And nothing occurred to him. Couldn't the rector, through his daughter, have asked him to write a letter of resignation? David had never acted that way. Maybe there's a guy in this girl who failed the session and she wants to ask for him. What if she heard from the other students about his former habits, and the girls were willing to pay for an A? He saw her on the intercom. A short, dark-haired girl. Kate, asked the girl, nodded. He opened the front door. He met Kate by the elevator. He had never paid such respect to any of the female students, but still the only daughter of the rector. Jacob is used to being able to charm girls literally from the first words, and now, as they call it, turned on the charm. However, looking closely at Kate, he began to get confused in words. The girl was amazingly beautiful, truly a gift of nature. She did not need to paint her face, resort to the tricks of cosmetics. But Kate acted as if she were the same age as Jacob, an adult without any embarrassment. He sensed her inner calm. He invited her into the living room, offered her tea or coffee. Sit down, Kate asked. And when he sank down beside her on the edge of the couch, she said bluntly, I want to talk to you about Betty. That's it. The last thing Jacob realized was that Betty was clearly a former outsider, could be friends with the Chancellor's daughter. Was it as sneaky as he'd never suspected? And what was it? He asked, to give Kate a chance to reveal her cards first. Does she know much she wants to achieve money or for him to marry Betty? I'm taking responsibility for this child, Kate said. There's no way he expected that. I such direct words and that she would say exactly that. Damn it, how good was she? And he's a sophisticated man, couldn't take his eyes off Kate. What do you mean? Those words came easy to me. My mind was racing. Jacob tried to concentrate. I'm going to make sure that Betty does well. I'm asking you to stay out of it. You've already made it clear you won't marry her. And I talk her out of it, to be honest. It wouldn't work if you forced yourself to do it. She'd have spent her life trying to make you happy. And she'd have ruined her own. That's it now. I mean it, don't touch her again. I'm taking over. Kate got up almost easily. Jacob wanted to help her walk to the door, but she made a dismissing gesture with her hand, saying, I can do without your help. He only had to stand in the hallway and watch as the door slammed shut behind her. Later that afternoon, Kate had a long conversation with Betty. Here's what we're going to do. You're moving in with us now. I don't mind. You'll find a spare room and your parents won't say a word against it, she said. 
The first thing we have to do is to get you through university. Not to live without your aunt, not to travel every day across the city in a packed bus. We'll prepare for the spring session together. My dad and mom will be happy that I have a friend now. You'll go to your mom's for the vacations. Of course, she will have to go through all this, but still she will accept it in the fall, who gave birth to more than half a year to an academic. Don't take it, you'll be back by the winter session. Nothing, we we'll manage. Kate was right. They did manage to get over the hurdle together. But it was because Betty accepted her position that she was not alone. In the evenings, the two of them would sit and talk about everything. As the warm spring twilight descended upon the land, they drank apple juice and made plans. It was here in this house that it was easiest to study. Maybe it was the example of Kate, who herself sat a lot at textbooks. Betty went home after she had passed her classes with honors. Of course, the first days were not easy for her. Both her mother cried and she herself cried. But to Betty's surprise, her mom was the first to pull herself together and started preparing the baby dairy. At the end of September, baby girl Clara was born, and Kate became her red. Kate knew her friend would be back in a few months, but she still missed her. True, she had to worry these days. Maria was facing a complicated diagnosis because of her mom. She told herself about it. My Dr. Daniel's eyebrows are coming together. I hate the ultrasound machine black and white breaks on the screen always hiding something you didn't realize was there. Take a look at this. This is what I do not like, said Denis Vasilevich in the chest at 10 o'clock tumor, and not all of its features correspond qualitatively. He tries to explain understandable kindly, as it is supposed to the doctor of the paid office. She talks about fuzzy borders and blood flow. Later he leaves the terms and exclaims, looking at my faces no longer professionally, but sincerely. Well, don't bury yourself before your time and add quietly. On Monday, you will come to the oncology. You need to take a pension. It will be made urgently. I go out. I remember in the lobby young administrator, describing the account of women waiting in line warm evening behind the open door, the wind plowing in my face. But the whole thing was unreal. It was like through absorbent cotton and the hand felt like it wasn't my own. I took my cell phone out of my bag. I couldn't call my mom or my sister. I could only call our family doctor, Martin. It was the only thing now, not even a rope, a thread, a salvation. What if there was more to it? Martin, as a musician, has an absolute ear for illness, and they live. My mind was jumbled. I paused, remembering how the words I needed to say sounded. I'm going into surgery. You're gonna tell me the truth. How serious is it? A friend of mine used to say when someone got really sick, when you're in trouble like this, you knock on every door and other people will tell you. I got the same disease. I'm the one and only. There's no need to be shy. And they start knocking on your mother's door. The door never closes. He always stands on the threshold with his back turned to his own life and sees and treats only those who knock. And now as busy as he is, Martin doesn't say no, he's just leaving for surgery, and he'll call when it's done and call to see him. There was still life to be lived. The journey home is two hours long with a layover. An evening where I sit with the phone on my lap, and what's on the ringer? The journey to the hospital in the late twilight. I realize it's a shame to be so afraid for myself, to walk away from serious illnesses. Children. Fate is ruthless to the unrepeatable. When she was lying in the ward in full consciousness and talking to her mother, the doctor came in and said how much can you waste medication? She's already dying. It's time to take the needle out. What am I compared to them? Kate, what's gonna happen to her? I mean, she's literally not on her feet yet. 800 hours. 9. Half past 10 o'clock call. Come on in. I'm still in surgery. He's done with the surgery. I know the feeling. No, one wine won't make you as drunk as this fatigue. We're sitting here, two ogled men. He's fatigued, I don't seem to be driving, says Martin after the examination. And with these words, I can survive the weekend. But on the day when I have to go to oncology to find out the results of the function, I'm being absolutely disgraceful. I lie on the couch, stuffed with sedatives, sorry, brandy. I lie there, numb, and occasionally start sobbing. 
function finds no cancerous cells in the tumor too they have to operate. But the prognosis is good. After stressing a few days later, I start to have pain all over everything my back, legs, joints, fingers, and toes. And even eyelids pills don't relieve this pain. I can't even sleep with my foot on the pillow. Oncology impatient. Doctor, there are two such experienced doctors here. They walk down the corridor swiftly, keeping their heads down, seemingly not noticing anyone. It's only seeming. They may not remember their names, but the case is perfect. Here you are, three people with your fingers in the women's dressings. What's your last name? Come with me. I want to watch you affectionately, not only with the seriously ill. Strange, says the doctor, having examined me. I don't. 30 years old watching a woman bruise. Two centimeter swelling. Would have noticed, do you think? Go to our cleaner, get a third opinion. Otherwise, I shouldn't have authorized you. But ah, uh, the ultimate decision is mine. The ultrasound cleans finds the tumor immediately and outlines the breast with a black marker. Before marriage, sensuality is in question. I am taken into surgery. I learn later that I am lucky. That people like me after three, four months of waiting in line, being put in inpatient units, go up to the nurse's office every day and wait hopelessly for another hour. Finally, the nurse comes out. The doctors don't have time for you today. Dismissed. They get up, wander through the wards. Monday, Tuesday, everyone's home with husbands. Children, Wednesday. You're lucky. The doctors have half an hour today. Two of them quickly changed their clothes, took off their rings and earrings to the elevator and me. And you next time lucky literally evaporate to in a minute already in full readiness to emerge elevator. We are sitting in the anteroom of the operating room. Three women in line wrapped in white sheets, right sledding in a Roman bath. There are no Euro renovations here. This is where the tiles fall off. This is where the most difficult minutes are for doctors. On the operating table, you're literally disintegrating. Arms out to the sides and strapped down for anesthesia. I really don't care what it takes, as long as I get a diagnosis. It's nice to have a screen so I can't see. Thank God, the nurse hangs the tape on a special holder in front of my face. The minutes drag on endlessly. The lights go out. And who's gone? Just the nurse. Stand to my side. Don't rush for another hour, we're waiting for the two more results. Good quality. They're letting me go home. By 8 o'clock I go to oncology for dressings. There are 20 of us in line. And I, who still has a moral so amazed and delighted. Shoulder hurts, complains a woman without one breast. This week, 200 cans of tomatoes twisted. Have you already bought underwear? Another woman asks. And what about for 1,100? This is the third. And where did you get it? The fourth greedily asks. Show me. The woman looks around the corridor is a doctor, a very young guy. I wasn't there, she pulls up her shirt. Here's a beautiful bra with lace all over it. I've got this, and I've got a hallway full of it. Naked. The doctor just shakes his head. But you're good. The doctor can't even see me anymore. I'm a thing of the past to him. I'm not offended at all. He's got 10 complicated cases, 10 rooms, beds in the hallway. Thank him for everything. But why doesn't anyone believe me? Martin asks, I said good quality. I'm not saying that I believe him so much that going to the operation. I touched the wall of his house, as I would lie down in the temple to the icon, asking for help from above. I have known for a long time that God is with him. That's what happened to Kate's mom. And thank goodness everything turned out all right. By Christmas, Betty was back in school. David's help was invaluable. He helped the young mother get a part-time job at the university in one of the departments. There was not much time left until graduation, and Betty's mother said she would take care of the baby herself. Her daughter sent her the money she had earned, and everything settled down. Jacob sobbed with complete freedom. She knew that if she began to decide through the courts, it would be difficult to enter the muddy water. She decided to avoid it. Much later she found out that the professor had contacted her mom and was sending her money every month too. And as a practical woman, she decided to accept that help. But she didn't say anything broader, it's not easy as it is. And when my daughter graduates from university and gets a job, 
I'll just save the money the father sends for Clara, the mother thought. David had a crush on her. I think he even dreamed about her. He often thought of her. How sometimes you fall in love in spite of your own plans, calculations, attitudes. But he realized that after everything that was going on Kate would not give him a chance and sent money for his daughter. Thought that if Kate ever found out about it, he would not look like such a scoundrel in her eyes. The hobby friends graduated at the same time. At Kate's house they had a feast. As the girl said, only for her own people. Betty in the kitchen tried her best to set the table beautifully. David, Maria, if it wasn't for you, thank you. She stood with a glass of champagne in her hand and tears in her eyes. Oh, don't worry about us. Here's a favor for you. Anything always on Kate's mind. I mean, she's a bright head. And now to go to grad school. Then I'll take her to Germany for surgery. That was the plan. So what? So she wants to go back to where she was born. Liam's back, working where he did hers. It felt like Maria was in deep distress. I'm not saying I'm leaving for good, Kate said quietly, but we must see Kostya and decide together what to do next. We only waved our hands in the heat of the moment. Her old life seemed to her, if not hell, then purgatory, from which she had escaped with great difficulty. And the fact that Kate had decided to return to those parts filled her soul with fear, while Kate was joyful, just waiting for what she had dreamed of all her life. She insisted, and a few days later her relatives put her on a train of places in street well then. She tried to cheer up her parents. Maybe I'll come with you for the 1,000th time, Mom. No, I'll come. You'll see. And you'll send me to Germany. I will. Mother nodded, trying to smile, but wiping away her own tears. Liam met Kate at the station. They stood embraced for so long that they didn't notice the passengers leaving. And then they talked, interrupting each other and yet understanding each other half-heartedly. And our house is boarded up. I'll keep an eye on it. Don't think about it. If you want, even today you can go in there, and your mom is waiting for the room, she has prepared pies for you on the table. What with the raspberry jam, you'll be picking raspberries soon. She will. Liam laughed. Everything was already agreed between them. So, they would apply this week too. Neither of them wanted to wait any longer. And Kate, having lived in the city most of her life, realized that her place was here and at the university. That's why she chose biology. A job would be found at least as a teacher at school teaching the kids to love the local nature she loved so much. At home at Lyons the girl was so cheerful and talkative, as they had not seen her for a long time. The lush pies were good, and so was the flavor. Tea was brewed with herbs. They sat at the table until nightfall, and then Kate slept as soundly as she had in recent years. The air here is a special froth more often, she said. It was a few days after her arrival. The whole family was sitting down to dinner. Kate carried a teacup card and suddenly dropped it. The hot tea spilled over the table into her lap. Liam's mother shrieked. Liam became alarmed. Kate looked up into Kate's face. What's wrong? Are you feeling okay in there? said Kate, pointing to the window and not taking her eyes off him. Did you see that? What's wrong? The man's face pressed against the glass so scary, unfamiliar. My God! Liam's mother believed her at once, and the young man ran outside. To see who had frightened Kate. It was already dark, and he didn't see anyone. Kate was amicably reassured. Liam's mother suggested that it might have been the Alki neighbor who lived near them probably came to borrow money. Yeah, he saw a stranger and was shy. Kate nodded and pretended to calm down, but she couldn't sleep for a long time. She dreamed of that pale face in which she recognized familiar features. No, it couldn't be, of course. Probably her subconsciousness called up in her memory the past appearance of her father. So she had imagined it. Then came the bright sunny days when Liam returned from work. He always took Kate for a walk. It was as if it was easier for her to walk here. They reached the far cellar where it was already beginning to mature. They visited a forest stream. Since the hunting huts did not want, Kate did not want. It has long been in negative condition, standing without windows and doors. There's nothing to see there, Liam agreed. You know how there's nothing to see. 
Is the house an abandoned barn or will we be taken apart for firewood? And the hut was quickly taken over. But it's not convenient to carry it far from here. So the walls are intact. If I see this place, I'm afraid I'll hallucinate. Kate shook her head. You know, I'm much more aware of the past now. I can remember scenes I've long forgotten. How did my mom get me out of there? I can't imagine. Liam hugged the girl, he was much taller. Kate felt his strong arm, pressed against his chest, she became calm. She really wanted Liam to tell her that the past was in the past, that she would never meet her father again, that he would protect her from all harm. But Kate didn't ask to be reassured. For too long she had indoctrinated herself to be strong. You can't spring on the necks of others. Right now she was trying to keep her cool. She had plenty of free time during the day. And if before she was studying, preparing for exams, now the work was alone waiting for Kostya, and she decided to pass the time by going out, walking without him. She wanted to put what she had learned into practice and see firsthand the plants and animals she had studied at university. Kate now knew the Latin names for the life cycle of Paulus and Hebrew. She felt more at home in the Tega than ever before. Lion was wary of the idea, but Kate's voice was firm. You know my strength, I won't go away for more than two or three hours. I need it to make me feel like a full person, not an invalid who needs a companion. In the end, Lion relented, only asking her to be sure to bring her hunting rifles with her. You haven't forgotten how to shoot. In general, in summer I don't know what should happen to be attacked by a predator in the vicinity of the village. And we haven't seen bears around here for a long time. But as they say, it's better to be careful. He picked up one of his rifles, an old, lightweight one. Kate always took it with her. That time she decided to pick raspberries and hung the gun on one of the branches. Beaten by a racer, she went deeper into the thicket. Time flew by imperceptibly. The bidon was almost full. When someone grabbed Kate's arm, the grip was firm, hard not to rip out the chassis. The girl looked up and literally in the freezing cold was walking to the spot. The same face she thought she had resolved into a nightmare. An overgrown bearded man. Father. Kate said him and there was no doubt left. She couldn't even get a word out in response. I followed you. It was what mom was most afraid of. And she herself had troll fit Kate from somewhere. She didn't recognize her own voice. It got so thin and shaky that your mom thought she killed me. But I recovered. And now I'm far away living there. Skit cage is abandoned. No one will ever find it. How do you know what I am? So I get out to see people from time to time. You can't do without it. So you and me, we're gonna make it. When I came to get salt and matches, they told me you'd arrived. Your mom didn't want to live with me. God be with her. That's what she left me helpless. I won't forgive that. You can't do that in the Tega. I won't forgive you for separating us. No matter what you say, my blood is still yours. And for that I should be grateful. Kate pointed to her mangled leg. If it hadn't been for mom, I would have died out there in the woods. What would you have said then? You bring up natural selection again. If mom had gone crazy, that would have been okay too. A matter of everyday life that she, she herself did not notice how in place of fear comes from the ashes rage. The nation it seems is not in. Her anger, once you've lived a little longer you'll realize there's no place for a soft heart. Life is a cruel thing. You said it yourself. Remember, I don't belong here. And I don't want anything to do with you. Nonsense, Katya. Come with me. See how well we'll live together, we won't need anyone. Her father dragged her by the hand. Kate was definitely transported from a childhood, which she had to obey her father's every whim, when his will seemed inseparable. If she fell now, he wouldn't drag her to his abandoned hermitage. The fear she felt was more paralyzing than he could beat her with. He could let her go now for tomorrow, again devise some trap. He is clever and cunning and powerful. He might choose Kostya as his victim, so that she would have no reason to stay here, so that she would follow him out of desperation. But she had a chance, one single chance. The bidon, she said. I'll take it with me. I dropped it there in the cell phone. Her father even smiled. I think that's what Kate saw through his thick beard. Wait here, I'll get it. I said don't be afraid. 
I can't physically run away, Kate said. He disappeared into the bushes and returned a couple minutes later with the bidon that Kate had dropped and locked up. The daughter stood changing her foot in the stump and leading the guns at him. Crazy, she whispered for all to see. You've been dead a long time. The moment Kate pulled the trigger, her own heart stopped for a few moments. They were meeting her at the airport. The plane from Germany was about to land. David, Kate, Mom and Betty with her daughter in her arms. You say hello Godfather, break the horse. Baby in front of Clara. Just as long as the flight wasn't delayed. Maria was worried. That's how she got turned on. First, the surgery, then these complications. I'd rather have a limp all my life than go through this. But Liam was with her nonstop. And I think that was a great support for her. And about the surgery, it was a scooter decision, convincing his wife. What did you decide? Maria turned to Betty. Well, what would you have heard Jacob repenting? Said it took him a while to realize it. He was orphaned without me. Without us, that's us. So what? Betty shook the baby on his arm to make the girl more comfortable. We're going back like this. At this time it was announced that the plane they were waiting for was coming in for a landing. Yet they couldn't wait to see Kate. Lion was walking behind her with heavy bags, and Kate was looking around in the crowd for her family. And when she saw her family, she waved her hand and walked as lightly as if it hadn't even happened. Past the massive stick of a heavy step, little Clara waved back at her and shouted hello.